I'm Jaya Kavle and together with my colleague Elliot, we'll be talking about the Monkey Arm Bandit Framework for recommendations at Netflix. So are there any people in the room left who do not have a Netflix subscription <laughs> yet? Okay, very good. <laughs> so as you already know, this is the Netflix homepage. Uh, the goal of the Netflix homepage is to provide relevant and personalized content to each of its members. This involves uh, helping the members quickly find what they would like to watch as soon as possible. The risk is that if, we, if the members do not find the content that they would like to watch, they may lose interest and even cancel the subscription. The challenge is that we have 117 million plus members across the globe. Our recommendation systems thus form a core component of the Netflix homepage. In fact, recommendation systems were valued at about a billion dollars by a study recently. <clears throat> So the Netflix homepage consists of a variety of algorithms defined for various different objectives. And a few examples of the algorithms are like, for example, for topics, for trending now, because you watched uh, new releases, search, and even artwork personalization. So in artwork personalization, we try to present to you the right image for the right title. Our goal in the stock is a uh, recommendation on the billboard. Uh, the goal of the billboard is to recommend a single, large, a single relevant title to each of its members and to respond quickly to member feedback. Uh, so the figure over here shows the billboard for Daredevil. It's the large banner that you see on the Netflix homepage. So traditional approaches for recommendations, such as collaborative filtering, have been widely applied and have been very successfully applied in various industrial settings. Uh, so the idea of collaborative filtering is based upon the wisdom of the crowd. Uh, it is well understood, and it is widely used in practice. There are a variety of different algorithms that exist. One of the most popular algorithm is the matrix factorization-based algorithm. So even though these techniques have been widely successfully applied in various industrial settings, they face several challenges when applied to a practical setting. Uh, for example, scarce feedback, dynamic catalog, which is very true in our case because the catalog keeps on changing, new titles get added to the service, non-stationary member base, the member base itself is changing and growing. So there is a time sensitivity aspect to uh, a lot of these practical problems that these batch traditional approaches are not meant to handle. For example, the content popularity changes over time, the member interests evolve over time, and as a result, these approaches are not designed to respond quickly to the member feedback. So a lot of the challenges that I mentioned over here are not just restricted to the recommendation domain, they can also be seen in various other domains, for example, in clinical trials, where you want to decide what medicine should you give to a patient. Uh, in case of network routing, when you want to decide where should you route your packet to. In case of online advertising, when you want to determine what ad you should you show on the website. Uh, in case of AI for games, and even in machine learning, in the case of hyperparameter optimization. Uh, so a new set of techniques called as multi-arm bandit techniques, um, which are basically online learning techniques, have become increasingly popular in these practical settings because they are more robust in handling the challenges that we mentioned earlier. Uh, so what exactly are these multi-arm bandits? So the idea of multi-arm bandits is actually quite old and is inspired from the idea of gambling in a casino. So imagine that there is a gambler who's gambling in a casino. There are multiple slot machines with unknown reward distribution. So there is a gambler who has got multiple arms. And the goal of the gambler is to maximize his earnings or to maximize the reward. And so the key question that the gambler is asking is which machine should he play in order to maximize the reward? Uh, 
note over here that the slot machines have got an unknown reward distribution. Because if the reward distribution were known, then all the gambler has to do is to play the slot machine with the largest expected reward. So let's see how uh, the uh, bandit algorithms actually work. So there is a learner which interacts with the environment via selecting an action. And the environment responds back to the learner by presenting a reward. So the bandit game proceeds as follows. Like for each round, the learner chooses an action from a set of available actions and presents it to the environment. The environment generates a real valued reward and presents it back to the learner. The goal of the learner is to maximize the cumulative reward or in terms of the bandit literature, minimize the cumulative regret. So the regret is the difference in the reward when the action was selected by the learner versus the optimal action that could have been selected by the learner in hindsight. So uh, at the heart of all these bandit algorithms is the exploration versus the excitation trade-off. The trade-off is as follows. Whether you should recommend the optimal title given the evidence so far that is exploit, or whether you should recommend other lesser known titles to gather feedback, that is explore. So why exactly do you need this exploration? Uh, so exploration, um, even though it may sound that it involves a shorter term sacrifice, is actually a good long term strategy. So exploration allows us to gather information to determine what would be an overall best action. Uh, so there could be various uh, strategies for exploration. Uh, one of the simplest one would be the naive exploration strategy in which you just add some noise to your greedy policy. Uh, there could be other strategies for exploration as well. For example, one of the other very famous strategy is optimism in the face of uncertainty. So what this principle is saying that you would prefer actions about which you have little information. So uh, in that way, you're going to explore more around that action, and as a result, gather more feedback about that action, and as a result, ga gain more confidence about your, uh, um, about your prediction for that action. Uh, now, there could be other ways for uh, uh, exploration as well. For example, probability matching. Uh, in case of probability matching, you select the actions with the, according to the probability by which they are the best. Uh, so I forgot to mention that optimism in the face of uncertainty is uh, the heart of one of the most famous uh, multi arm bandit algorithm, which is called as the upper confidence bound algorithm. And probability matching uh, is, uh, is the heart of Thompson sampling based algorithms. So apart from categorizing the different multi arm bandits according to the way we are performing exploration, there could be other ways to categorize the multi arm bandit techniques. Uh, for example, the different environments. So in case uh, the environment is stochastic and stationary, um, that is one category of multi arm bandit algorithms. So in, uh, in by stochastic and stationary, I mean that the reward is generated IID from a fixed unknown distribution for the action. Uh, by stationary, I mean that there is no payoff drift. Uh, on the other hand are the adversarial multi arm bandit techniques, which do not make any assumption about how the reward is generated. And um, uh, these are assumed to be a little bit pessimistic as compared to the stochastic and stationary based techniques. Now, we could also classify the multi arm bandit techniques depending upon the different objectives, whether we want to track the cumulative regret or whether we want to track the best expert. The action space now could be like either continuous or discrete. It could be finite or infinite. So coming back to our problem, uh, there could be several extensions of these multi arm bandit techniques. Uh, for example, uh, extensions handling dynamic set of arms, extensions handling context. So context is the feature associated with the action, with the user, or with the user uh, action pair. And uh, these bandits are called contextual bandits and are um, very widely used in practice. So 
So in this talk, we will fo focus upon a very uh, naive uh, multi-arm bandit strategy, which is which we call as the epsilon greedy approach. Uh, the idea of epsilon greedy is very simple and is as follows. With a uniform probability epsilon, you uniformly explore one of the titles in your candidate pool. Uh, the advantage of this very naive exploration is that it provides unbiased data, which can be then used for training. Uh, exploitation, in the, in the exploitation phase, we select the optimal action with the probability 1 minus epsilon. So just highlighting the key aspects of our framework. So our framework can support a different contextual bandit algorithms. Even though we talk about epsilon greedy, it can very well support other contextual bandit algorithms like Thompson sampling, UCB, et cetera. It's a closed loop system. So like it helps establish the link between how recommendations are made and how the members respond to them. Um, it supports snapshot logging, so logging of facts, which is very helpful for feature generation for offline training. And it provides regular updates of policies, which is very important for online uh, learning algorithms, so as to make the policies as fresh as possible. Uh, with that, we'll now move on to the system architecture, which will be covered by Elliot. Thanks. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Elliot, and I'll yeah talk about the architecture of the system that we use um, to power these uh, multi arm branded uh, experiments that we want to run. So this is a very high level view of what it means to serve a recommendation at Netflix. So when we need to do this online, um, or when a user comes in, we generate the recommendation online. Uh, at the same time, we log information about why we re made this recommendation. And we also then observe and record what the the, custom, the member does in response to this recommendation. This data is then put back together um, for training and updating our model. So Jaya mentioned uh, closing the loop of the system. So when we talk about that, we are talking about this red line, right? So we have basically um, the data associated with recommendation. We want to know exactly what that ultimately leads to um, in terms of member activity. So we can break down our uh, system into online and offline components. Online, we need to apply our explore exploit policy, uh, log the contextual information, and of course, we need to score and generate our recommendations. Uh, offline, we'll do attribution assignment um, to piece together the data, and also model training. So first step is to apply our explore exploit policy. So we need to generate a candidate pool of titles. This is the pool of titles, the total pool of titles, that uh, we can choose from when we're trying to pick a, uh, pick a rep, uh, generate a recommendation. Then we actually select a title from this candidate pool. In our uh, ex epsilon greedy case, um, we would first flip a coin to decide if we want to explore or exploit. In the case of explore, we'll then randomly sample from our candidate pool to pick a title. Uh, in the exploit case, we can apply our model to pick the, the most optimal uh, recommendation. While we're doing this, we also need to log uh, quite a bit of information, um, especially since uh, we have different types of bandits that we might be using, uh, understanding why we made certain decisions, like uh, why we made certain recommendations um, is very important. So from the on the bandit side, we want to log information about uh, things like the exploration probability, the candidate pool uh, that was available at that time, and also the selected title. And we also snapshot facts for future generation. So facts for us are pretty loosely defined. It's basically any data that we can use to derive uh, features from. And this is mostly a trade-off for us in terms of how much data we want to store and process, um, while also enabling uh, as many features, um, uh, while enabling us to generate as many features as we uh, can. <coughs> so next, we can do uh, attribution assignment. So this is the process of taking uh, the data that we've logged, the different bits of data that we've logged, and connecting them together. So this uh, connection needs to be both correct and meaningful. So 
In our billboard case, we would first fil filter down to relevant member activity. So in this case, we might be interested only in uh, events or data that's relevant to the, the billboard experience. Then we actually join with the exploring exploit information. Um, and we can also define and construct our sessions. So a session is just uh, some grouping of these uh, me of member activity um, that makes sense for, for us when defining our rewards and labels. <clears throat> then from these sessions, we can yeah, actually define our, our, our labels. So just to recap a little bit, this is what it looks like um, when we construct our home page. So one of the components of the home page um, is the billboard. So we will generate the candidate pool of titles, apply our model, and uh, to select one. Um, this information, along with a lot of other information about the other rows, is used to actually render the home page. Uh, and eventually, uh, the user can play a title from that home page. On the logging side, uh, this is kind of what we observe. So the key relationship we want to uh, establish is this dark arrows in the, in the top here. Um, this basically connects the data used for generating the recommendation all the way through to what the user actually sees on, his, uh, on the device and to his ultimate response, which is, in this case, a play of title A. The gray arrows down here at the bottom show uh, what additional relationships that we might be interested in. So it's a possible uh, sessionization strategy we might want to uh, apply. So in this case, we, in addition to just the play and the impression that directly led to the play, we are also interested in the impressions coming from the rest of the home page. Once we have our labels defined, we can generate our features. So we join our uh, labels with our snapshotted facts. This is done through a Netflix library called DeLorean. Um, and this uh, library allows us to do time travel and allows us to pick the correct version of uh, data to be used for those labels. Also, uh, this uh, library allows us to share, use um, the same feature encoders online and offline. This prevents us from introducing discrepancies or bugs when we switch between the online and offline worlds, and we can guarantee that what we evaluate in each setting is the same. Once we have our labels and features, we can finally train and uh, validate our model. And when that looks good, um, we can publish the model to production. So the model is running, and uh, we want to make sure that things are looking uh, good. Um, aside from just normal A-B test metrics, um, for these multi arm bandit models, we found a few other kind of classes of metrics to be useful to look at. Um, first is about the distribution of the arm pools. So you have many, many arms that you potentially are selecting from. So you want to make sure that when uh, you observe what your model is doing that it's fairly stable, um, otherwise you, it might be misbehaving. Um, you also want to look and compare, explore and exploit, uh, be, the, look at the differences between explore and exploit. Um, since explore, especially if you're doing uniform exploration, uh, the distribution should be fairly uh, uh, well uh, uniformly distributed over our, all the arms, and your exploit should hopefully be picking uh, better titles over l uh, less popular titles. Um, <clears throat> we also want to look at uh, take rate related metrics. Um, so hopefully our model is learning and improving, so they should be converging uh, over time and relatively quickly. Um, we also want to compare online and offline uh, results uh, of ta our take rate estimates so that um, we know that they're at least directionally um, observing the same things. And we also, again, want to comp compare, explore, and exploit. So, uh, so especially since uh, explore is random, uh, we would hope that our recommendations in exploit are better than uh, random. And with that, I'll let Jaya tell you more about uh, some of the experiments that we've actually tried with this uh, system. Uh, 
So, so far we have seen the framework for. So far, we have seen the framework for generation of these multi amp banded policies. So let's now look at like some of the example policies that we implemented using this framework. So before we go on to the framework, let's have a quick uh, look at the notation. Let small k denote the set of titles that are there in the candidate pool uh, when a member arrives on the Netflix homepage. Let xik denote the context vector um, a context vector for the member i and the title k. So the context vector could represent the features for the member, the features for the title, the features for the member title pair, and also features for the session, and so on. Let yik represent the label uh, when the member i was shown the title k. So the very first policy that we consider is a simple policy which we call as the greedy exploit policy. The policy is as follows. We learn a model per title in the candidate pool to predict the likelihood of play. And finally, we select a winning title which maximizes this probability of play. So now various models could be used to predict the probability of play. For example, logistic regression, neural net networks, or gradient boosted decision trees. So. Just to give a recap, the member arrives on the Netflix homepage. We have four titles in the candidate pool. We extract the features for the member and the title. Uh, we already have generated four models. Um, uh, we have already trained four models earlier. So what we do is now, uh, at online time, we just score the four models for the member for the features that we extracted and compute a probability of play. Finally, we select a winning title as the title which maximizes our probability of play. <coughs> so very simple. Uh, but oftentimes, a key question that we ask in recommendation is whether the member played the title because we showed it to them, or would they have played the title anyways? So this key question is very important and uh, has been studied in various other domains as well. Uh, for example, let's consider the case of search advertising. The goal of search advertising is to target users to increase the conversion. Uh, so over here, we see that when a user comes on the Google website, he types the keyword Macy's. So the top link is the link, is the sponsored link to the Macy's website, and the bottom link is the actual link to the Macy's website. So when the user has typed the keyword Macy's, they have already actually expressed their intent to buy. So when finally they convert, the key question to ask is whether they converted because the ad was shown to them, or would they have converted anyways? Uh, so this brings us to a very important concept called as incrementality, which is widely used in advertising. Uh, the goal of incrementality is to measure ad effectiveness. Uh, so how incrementality proceeds is as follows. You randomly divide your population into control and treatment group. Uh, in, in your control group, you show other people's advertisement. And in the treatment group, you show your own advertisement. And finally, you compute the difference in the revenue generated from the advertisement. Uh, and compute this delta, which is known as the incremental lift, or the incremental value of the advertisement. So incrementality actually helps measure the difference in the outcome uh, because the ad was shown and because the ad was not shown. So let's try to map this concept of incrementality into our case, which is the billboard case. So what we want to do, if we want to have an incremental policy on the billboard, we want to show the title, which has the largest additional benefit from being shown on the billboard. Note that apart from the billboard, there are the rest of the home page as well can surface the title. So the member could see the title because the other rows uh, showed the title, or also because uh, he searched the title. So mm, popular titles tend to appear multiple times on the Netflix home page. Uh, for example, trending now. Um, so in this case, it might be better to utilize the real estate on the Netflix home page by showing a title which would have the largest additional benefit from, from being shown on the billboard. 
so we can define now an incremental policy on the billboard by saying that a policy which is incremental with respect to the probability of play. So just uh, summarizing it, the goal of an incremental policy on a billboard is to recommend a title which has the largest additional benefit from being shown on the billboard. So now, instead of a greedy exploit policy in which we were trying to maximize the probability of play, what we do is try to maximize the delta probability of play, where the delta is computed as the difference in the probability of play when the title was shown on the billboard versus when the title was not shown on the billboard. So we have these two policies uh, right now, uh, the exploit policy and the incremental, incrementality based policy. Uh, what we did was we did an offline and online comparison of these two policies. Uh, so for offline comparison, we relied upon this method called replay, which is a standard method for evaluating contextual bandit algorithms. Uh, so the uh, method is as follows. Uh, it relies upon uniform exploration data, and it assumes uh, that for every record in the exploration data, we already know the title which was shown, the context vector, uh, the reward which was obtained, and the list of the candidate titles. So the method proceeds as follows. For every record in the exploration data, we evaluate the trained model on all of the list of the candidate titles. So the candidate titles are the titles that could have been shown instead of this title, which was shown in the exploration data. Uh, we pick the winning title according to the trained model. Uh, let the winning title be K dash. And finally, we construct a history in which we keep a record in the history only if the winning title k dash equals to the title which was shown in the exploration log data. Uh, and finally, we compute the metrics from this history. So just revising it again, like we have for every record in the exploration data, we have the context, the title which was shown, the reward that was obtained, and the list of the candidate titles. For every candidate title, uh, we, uh, we, we reveal the context to the train model. The train model selects a winning title, K dash. We use the reward, or like we append to the history, only if the reward, only if the winning title, K dash, is equal to the title, K, which was logged in the exploration data. And at the end of it, we compute the metric, which is like, in this case, let's say, take rate, by just computing the number of plays divided by the number of matches from the history. So the figure over here shows uh, an offline lift in replay uh, as compared to the random baseline for the two policies, the exploit policy and the incrementality based policy. So as we see over here, the exploit uh, based policy performs a little bit better than the incrementality based policy. And this is kind of a little bit expected as well because the uh, exploit policy is going to optimize for the, uh, for the most popular title or the title which has the highest probability of play. And the incrementality based policy kind of sacrifices that by showing a lesser known title which would benefit by sh being shown on the billboard. So let's take a deeper look at this and try to understand this part a little bit better. Like which titles would actually benefit uh, from being shown on the billboard. So the figure over here shows a scatter plot between the baseline probability of play and the incremental probability of play. So over here, we see that title A represented by the blue dots uh, has got a very low baseline probability of play. But as when we show it on the billboard, its incremental probability of play is very high, which means that this title would definitely benefit by being shown on the billboard. On the other hand is title C, which is represented by the green dots, uh, which already has a very high baseline, uh, baseline probability of play. So it's probably a very popular title. So because of that, it doesn't benefit as much by being shown on the billboard. And hence, its incremental probability of play is not that high. So definitely, um, title C doesn't benefit from being shown on the billboard, whereas title A does benefit from being shown on the billboard. We also did an online comparison of the, these two policies. And what we saw online was uh, that the replay take rates definitely follow the patterns that we had seen offline. 
And uh, our implementation of incrementality, the way we defined it over here, is able to shift uh, the engagement within the candidate pool from a very popular title to some of the lesser known titles in the candidate pool. So, so far we have seen that uh, we provided a general framework for uh, recommendation of multi-arm bandit algorithms. We can plug in different multi-arm bandit policies. We showed an example of two simple policies. Uh, but the framework is very generic and allows, it enables research in various directions. For example, uh, research in the direction of policy exploration. Now we can plug in different multi-arm bandit policies, for example, Thompson sampling, UCB, etc. There could be other ways of combining causal inference. So causal inference is really important um, in trying to understand the value of recommendation. And we just presented a very simple way increment of incrementality-based policy to plug in causal inference. But maybe there are like other different ways which we can try to explore uh, using this framework. Uh, we can also do uh, like model exploration, for example, uh, plug in different models, neural networks, logistic regression, GBDTs, etc. Uh, another key thing that the framework allows, which is very important, is reward exploration. So, so far we have shown uh, like probably a short-term reward in which we are trying to optimize for, let's say, the probability of play or something like that. But as a company, we generally care about like long-term reward, like retention, for example. And hence, uh, how can we bring in those long-term rewards? Um, that's definitely an area of research um, as well. Uh, maybe it involves uh, uh, moving more towards reinforcement learning. Um, but yes, uh, the framework opens the door for like uh, exploring the different kinds of rewards as well. Also, the, there could be different kinds of rewards uh, which could be obtained from um, uh, from different things, for example, play versus play from the billboard versus, like, let's say something else. Um, so um, the framework allows us to explore these different kinds of uh, rewards as well. Um, thank you. So with that, we have uh, <laughs> um, come to the end of the talk. Excellent. So we've got time for two questions. And then reminder again, uh, Jai and Elliot will both be in office hours just out the store to the left after this. So let's take two questions now. Question number one. Right. Hi, uh, my name's Nathan. That was a great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, highlighting the differences between the greedy exploit and the incrementality based one. So clearly there's like a trade or yeah, trade-off between like showing the title that has just straight up the greatest probability of play, but then also, you know, how do you get more attention to the uh, ones that are lesser known that would give an increase in play? So uh, I'm sorry if you already went over it, but how does that decision get made between the two? Um, is, is there a specific thing you guys do to choose between the one that has the highest or the highest increase? Oh, so these are two different policies, like the way we have shown over here, they are completely different policies, so they don't interact with each other. And uh, like we studied the two policies in isolation, but that's a very good question. Like maybe we can try to like bridge the gap and uh, blend the two together and like have another policy which... Uh, I guess maybe an ensemble the, of the two yeah. to, you know, see yeah. what happens with yep. doing that. Okay, cool, Thanks. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> microphone. No microphone, no no question. <laughs> Who else? All right. Hi there. Um kind of as a Netflix consumer, I'm just kind of interested, what do you regard as a successful play? Because if I I'm induced to click something, and I watch 25 minutes of the opening episode of a season, and I don't like it. I actually, that's, ne that's negative to me, because you've wasted 25 minutes of my time. Um, so uh, do you regard that as a, as a success or a failure? So 
Actually, there are no specific rules of thumbs. Like we have like a variety of different algorithms which are defined for like a completely different objectives. And uh, yeah, there, uh, there is no like specific rule on like we should define a play as this or that. 